Who doesn't love a good love song now and again? Tomorrow morning if you wake up and the sun does not appear. Well, I mean, if you don't, no worries. Because there sure are plenty of great jilted lover songs. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. Oh, oh, you know, how about that country music kind of folks one that starts like this, I think. I got tears in my ears from lying on my bed in my back. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> While I cry over you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not the only ones strumming and singing and sobbing. You're probably sobbing after that. <laughs> As we continue in our series, which more soberly is titled, What Happens When a Created People Walk Away from Their Creator? We're looking at the love song, the love song, the love story between the Lord God and his people. We examined the beginnings, the genesis of this love story in the Garden of Eden. If you want to hear the beginning of that love song, you would listen to Genesis 1. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. But this song sounded a harsh note when Adam and Eve uh, sinned, walking away from their creator. And uh, evil was now known on earth. The song became even more discordant as evil multiplied to such a degree that the Lord was forced to restart the entire creation with a cleansing flood and with that faithful remnant, Noah and his family. And the song went on through the centuries. At times it was beautifully melodic as the Lord God loved his people and they loved him back. The Lord's wooing song was long and lovely. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past, The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. And the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs. And the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. At one time, the people joyfully sang back to him, My beloved is mine, and I am his. But things changed in their hearts, and so the song changed too. It became terribly dissonant, harsh, and even atonal as the people walked away from their creator time and again and suffered the consequences. We enter the music now, about 740 years before the birth of Christ. God's people have been settled in their land for many, many years. So many years that they've already undergone a split. The northern kingdom, called Israel, and the southern kingdom, called Judah. Judah is the land in in which the all-important temple of the Lord God is established. And sadly, cue the minor notes, please. 
The people have become complacent, perhaps even bored with God, and have become unfaithful to him in every way possible. The political climate is uncertain with the death of the king of Judah and and with the possible weakness of the regional power of that day, which was the brutal nation of Assyria. And, And power struggles begin in the whole region, which culminate in battles and wars and strife. Meanwhile, in the land of Israel and in the land of Judah, the society is breaking down into violence and oppression, especially oppression of the poor and the less fortunate. Overall, morals are on the decline. Public drunkenness, carousing, rioting. And most of the people have turned away from the Lord. They've become enthralled with foreign gods. They're worshiping other things, including themselves and and their so-called needs. But these unfaithful ones carry on their idolatry like, like it was some sort of secret affair. They turn up at the temple when they're supposed to, on the high holidays and on the weekly festivals, because, you know, for some reason they think perhaps the Lord God wouldn't notice that their hearts were no longer in this love song? Into this moment, Isaiah the prophet is called. Can you hear the music? Can you hear it swell as the young man from Judah who is so well connected to the temple priests and and to the king's court looks up into the heavens? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah's book in our Bible opens with the strong indictment of the people, a list of all that they had done against God. Chapters 1 through 5 of the book of Isaiah sets forth the themes of the entire book, themes of rebellion and redemption, themes of judgment and mercy, themes of a love song of a joyful lover and of a jilted lover. The people's rebellion, rooted in that self-love, that self-focus, would lead ultimately to the Lord's discipline. Because of their spiritual deafness, a continual ignoring of his call to repent that he was giving through his prophets, because of that, the Lord would, would have to levy the harshest of discipline, judgment, and at the hands of Judah's enemies. Not Assyria this time, but Babylon. Babylon, which would end up being the regional power at the end of all of the strife and the turmoil of Isaiah's earlier days. Babylon would be the Lord's instrument of judgment. When the people walked away from their God, they forfeited his blessings. They're, they are going to lose their land. 
their homes and families, and worst of all, their temple. But God's patience was great, so great. Isaiah was warning the people for some 40 years, starting around 740 BC. The final capture and kidnapping of the people into Babylon wouldn't happen until 586 BC. God gave time for the people to return to him. A lot, a lot of time. More than 150 years from Isaiah to exile. This then is the sad part of the Lord's love song. It is first sung by Isaiah in chapter 5, starting in verse 1, from the perspective of the beloved's faithful friend. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. The beloved planted his vineyard in the best place, in a fertile and sun-drenched soil. And he cultivated it. He, he removed all of the stones that were so prevalent in the land of Judah. The vineyard was comprised of the best of vines. And the beloved was, was no absent gardener. Oh no, he didn't sublet this out. He actually had a solid house, a watchtower, from which to keep an eye on the vineyard, to keep it protected. And he made provision, a wine vat, to store the rich wine that would come from those wonderful grapes. The fruit of his labors, rich and sweet and nourishing grapes and, vine, and wine. But the vineyard bore no good fruit. It bore wild grapes. Arab peoples called these, this kind of grape wolf grape. Bitter, miserly, inedible, and unsuitable for wine. A disappointing result of all the care given to the vineyard. The song now changes perspective from the faithful friend's voice to the voice of the beloved himself. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it when I looked for it to yield grapes? Why did it yield wild grapes? The Beloved calls upon the people of Jerusalem and the men of Judah those men who would normally serve as judges over various disputes. What's, what more indeed could have been done for this vineyard? All the care threw up sour, bad fruit. Is not the beloved entitled to take appropriate action against the vineyard? Any reasonable judge, as these men of Judah surely were, would concur. And the beloved will take action. And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. And I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled upon. I will make it a waste, 
It shall not be pruned or hold, and briars and thorns shall grow up. The beloved will remove his protection from the vineyard. He will remove the hedge of protection. He will break down its boundaries. He will allow the animals to trample it down. The vineyard will be destroyed, untended. For each one of the wild wolf grapes, the vineyard itself will gain a wild briar in thorn. And now the identity of the beloved is made clear. I will also command the clouds that they will rain no more upon it. For it is no ordinary vintner who can command the clouds. It's only the Lord God who has the power and the authority. The beloved is the Lord God. And the vineyard is his people. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Just in case the judges of Judah missed it, they and their people, which included the north, are the vineyard. They are the ones who yield up the sour, spoiled grapes. the sour fruit, bloodshed, instead of justice. The sour fruit, an outcry against evil instead of righteousness. For justice and righteousness should flow from the people of God. In the Hebrew, the words for justice and bloodshed sound alike, as do the Hebrew words for righteousness and outcry. This fruit is not fruit that belongs to the people of the Lord God in any good way. And so the people of God are the ones who will suffer the judgment, the removal of the Lord God's protection and his care, the invasion and enslavement at the hands of the Babylonians in the years to come. Because the people of God didn't, wouldn't repent. They kept on focusing on themselves. They kept on rebelling in idolatry, in lip service only worship, in moral degradation, in violence, in greed, in oppression. And so with the invasion of the Babylonians, they would lose themselves into slavery. Their rebellion would put them at the mercy of a hostile nation for 70 years. They would complete their idolatry by by losing their temple and the ability to worship the Lord God in any way, lip service or not. They would be plunged into a culture far more morally evil and violent and oppressive than the one that they created. And they would now become just like those they had oppressed. All this is the sour fruit of the sour fruit of their rebellion. The crashing notes that accompany a people who walk away from their creator. A sad, very sad song. But not the end of the song. Because after 70 years, there there will be a change in the melody. The lyrics from chapter 40 of Isaiah's book promises this. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended 
that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The Lord will restore his people to their land, to their freedom, and most importantly, to himself. Because this is the beloved's song. And we are also called into that love song. We are called to love the beloved. We are called to bear good fruit, fruit of the Spirit, nourishing rich fruit, fruit that reflects the care, the love, the character, the lavish provision of the Lord God. Even in the midst of a very sinful, rebellious people, Because like Isaiah, we might cry, Woe are we, for we are people of unclean lips, and and we dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And we do dwell in the midst of a rebellious people. Specifically here in New York State, and specifically in New York City, which is the center New York was one of the first states to liberalize abortion. It allowed the killing of babies in the womb by physicians, those who are specifically pledged to save lives. And New York State has one of the highest abortion rates in the country. A third of all pregnancies end in the killing of the child. And that doesn't take into account the impact of 2019's law that really opened up abortion to the third trimester, literally allowing the death of the baby if the mother's health is in danger all the way up to birth. In New York City alone, more than more black babies are murdered through abortion than are born alive. And if that death movement isn't enough. Now New York State is considering legalizing suicide, again, at the hands of those who pledge to save lives. New York City is also the place uh, that enshrined greed when it set up the stock exchange, initially a way simply for the rich to share wealth and get richer and richer and richer. And New York City is the place where men and women of authority mock and disparage the Lord God. The city that turns its Christian churches into nightclubs and its citizens into drug addicts. The kind of city whose people have walked away from their creator. And the Lord has long warned the people of New York City. Many, many times he has warned that they must change They must repent or judgment would come upon the city. I personally have had many dreams and prophecies warning of this judgment for the city and and for the nation of United States. For years I've had these, and I am not the only one. Recently, a very serious warning was issued. Rich, my husband, and I confirmed it and as did pastors Jim and Linda. The Lord says he will now judge the sin of New York City. When? I don't know. How? I don't know. But what I do know is that the Lord is also saying, this doesn't have to be the coda, this doesn't have to be the end of the song for New York City. The Lord is calling us at Westchester Chapel to help. He's calling us to pray for repentance for the people of New York City, to join with those other people who are already praying for repentance. Because the Lord will bring a great harvest of souls out of this judgment. He's also calling us to pray for mercy in two different ways. Mercy for his people, for his remnant, for protection for his people, for those who already love and serve him in the midst of this judgment. 
And he's calling us to pray for mercy also in praying for the mitigation of the judgment that's been planned, that the fullness of that judgment would not come upon New York City. We know that prayer changes the course of events. Consider September 11, 2001. More than 60,000 people were targeted for death that day because of all the terrorists, or between all the terrorist attacks. And sadly, 3,000 did die. But so many deaths were averted because the people of God were warned and they prayed. Some even saw the hijackers in their prayer visions. We at Westchester Chapel were specifically called to pray for the protection of those in the White House. And the Lord heard our prayers. The Lord moved to mitigate that disaster. And while every one of those people who died is precious and is mourned, there were only 5% of the possible deaths that actually occurred. The Lord is also calling us, in addition to calling us to pray for repentance and to pray for mercy for his remnant and in mercy in the judgment, he is also calling us to worship with intensity. The kind of intensity that Isaiah experienced when he saw the Lord high and lifted up. The kind of intensity with which the hosts of heaven worship. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. The Lord is singing a love song to you. It's not over yet. He is singing this over you. Open your ears, listen, hear his heart. Turn to the Lord and sing back to him. Sing, yes, sing yes. Woe are we, for we are lost. We are persons of unclean lips, and we dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Our eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And yet we say, yes, save us by the blood of Jesus. We turn from singing our own song, a song of sin and rebellion, and we join your song, your song of repentance and life. Clean us, and we shall be clean. Make us new, new creations. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Enable us to sing your song our song. And yes, Lord, I will help. We will help New York City. We choose to pray for repentance. We choose to pray for mercy. We choose to worship passionately. We choose your song, my beloved, our beloved. We choose our song. For there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Oh, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter, but he utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, 
Bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of a lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Do you hear the love song? The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Come, come beloved people of God, come. He is your beloved, and you are his.